Hi, my name is Julia Silge and I'm a data scientist and software engineer at our studio. And today in this screencast, we're gonna walk through the data set from this week's episode of Slice, the semifinals. The semifinals during which I was eliminated, but um, it was a interesting data set on um, uh, predicting home prices in Austin um, uh, using lots of different information about the real estate listings. And um, I, I, during the episode, I started using some of the text information to create like a higher, lower, um, price indicator based on text and did not get it done um, had R crashed on me and made some mistakes so in the screencast what I'm doing is walking through what um, that model that I didn't quite get finished and see um, what kind of results I get so let's get started okay let's walk through this data set from the um, semifinals semifinals I think semifinals uh, semifinals of sliced so I've got the um, training data here. And it just, uh, I think this is okay. Yeah, that's, that is what um, <clears throat> I saw earlier as well. So this is a data set, like I mentioned, of um, real estate listings in Austin, Texas. Um, we've got information on, you know, where it is, does it have a spa? <laughs> when was it built? Um, how big is the lot? Um, information on the public schools in the area. And what we're gonna predict is this price range. So it is, it is not, it is not a um, numeric value. It is a bind, um, uh, like like price that is that has been binned. So is it you know between zero and two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, two fifty, three fifty, and so on, or um, you know in, is it or is it above um, six hundred and fifty thousand? So um, they pick these bins so they're sort of evenish. Although there's more um, in the middle, less on the ends, which you might expect. So in, so this is um, a multi-class classification challenge, not um, a regression classification challenge. So let's do a little bit, before we get started on the model, let's just do a little bit of some, um, of some exploratory uh, uh, visualization. So we can, if we want, um, let's, let's call price range. And we can use, for example, the price, the parse number um, function, which is from read R, and um, force uh, force it to be um, a number. So what it does is it finds the first number of each of these, and you know, if we wanted, we could add a hundred thousand dollars. No, that's too many. There we go. So that it's kind of like in the middle of each of those ranges, if we like, and we can um, now say, let's do longitude, latitude, and let's say Z equals price range like that. And then we can do use one of my favorite little um, functions in ggplot2, which is the stat summary hex, to make a little hex map. And if you put, you know, we set that a little bit transparent and um, I don't know, bins, more, more bins than the default, and then use um, a scale fill um, viridis, which I think C is the right one for continuous like this. And what we get here then is a, um, a nice little um, map of Austin. Let's bump that up to 50. That's maybe too many. There we go. I like that. Okay. And we can change, you know, the lab. So fill, this is, that's the mean. That's the default in stat summary hex is the mean. We could put a, another argument here to change it and make it like median, which of course in this case would not do very much because we've got these binned numbers. But, um, and then we can say title equals um, price like that. And so what we have is um, uh, a map now of price. Uh, across these real estate listings in Austin. So we've got um, 
the you know latitude longitude we see these expensive houses here these less expensive houses across over in the east and you know kind of to the south a little bit here and um so th this distribution you know it looks like the spatial information is going to be really important for the um for the model so let's um let's save this uh this plot object here and then um let's let's make a few more plots uh, but the same kind of maps so i'm gonna i'm gonna make a function like this let's call it plot austin and i'm gonna call let's see i'll need a variable and let's a title and let's um let's take this and plop it in there and oh, we don't need this part because we're not going to be doing um, plot. And this is where var the variable will go. But we are going to um, use this from from like tidy eval. Uh, we're going to use this um, embracing um, uh, uh, this these embracing notation to say that what we're passing in is going to need to be um, parsed using uh, tidy evaluation and then the other thing we'll need to put in here is the um, title which I will pass in as a just as a string so for example now we can say um, plot Austin oh, what else do we have in there let's let's remind ourselves <laughs> you know, I bet average school rating is pretty interesting. And let's say school rating like this. Oh, right. So got to. OK, so here you can say this is much smoother, um, probably because these instead of individual houses, uh, we're probably looking at um, clumps of, you know, school districts or schools. I'm sorry, not school districts, but, you know, like where schools are zoned for. And so again, you know, if you want to look at like the price. And then the school rating, right? Like these are really related, right? So school rating, I'm sure, is going to be really important for price. So let's do a couple of these. And actually, let's let's load the patchwork function um, package. And let's do something like price plot plus um, that one. And then let's... So, so this means I'll put those two on the top and then let's do a couple more. So let's say, um, let's do that year built, which will probably have a different distribution. Year built, built. And then let's do, um, Let's do the lot size, lot size, square feet like this. And let's say the lot size like this. All right, that's looking pretty good. Oh, it looks like there's some really enormous. Those are probably not correct, actually. Those um, like if we look at this here, these are probably not right these um in, i mean i don't know it's possible i guess but i bet they're not right those like really enormous lots let's let while we're here let's um let's just take the log of that uh and let's let's put that here log all right so let's look at this All right, this looks pretty interesting to me. Okay, so price and school rating, super, super correlated, right? Um, good schools are where the expensive houses are. Um, year built is pretty interesting because it's different. They're like the old, the old um, homes are, are in the center of the 
city. And then as you move out farther, you see the newer homes, the newer homes. So we've got, we've got this sort of east-west gradient and we've got this in-out shape. And then here, uh, you know, we're affected by these really small lots, which may be, um, you know, condos and townhomes or maybe uh, bad data, to be honest. But we all we kind of have this gradient from smaller over here to larger over here. So on the west side out over here, we have like big lots, bigger lots over here and maybe some problems with the data. I'm not entirely sure, but we could explore that a little bit more to learn it, learn about it. Okay, so the, this kind of relationship, these kind of relationships are what we want to try to use to build a model, to predict price. Remember, price, bind, is this thing we want to predict. We want to do it with this other information like, um, like what are the schools like? How big is the lot size? When was it built and whatnot? So let's, um, let's get started because one thing that is here is, Let's do it like this. Let's say um, slice sample um, n equals five. And let's select the um, description, I believe. Okay, so we have, oh, come on. We have the descriptions from the real estate, from the real estate listings. You know, they're telling us maybe the address, custom modern home, charming remodeled home, master down, the downstairs, the master's downstairs, perfect opportunity to get in highly desired Havana, um, stunning inside and out. You know, so these are these descriptions. And so um, during Sliced, I attempted to do this, but then sadly ran out of time. I, um, <clears throat> um, you know, R crashed on me actually, because I, I think I was, I did something. I made it angry. So what I want to walk through here is um, uh, how we can maybe find the words that are most associated with price and then use that to create a dummy or indicator variable. We could use this text data directly, tokenize and use, um, uh, you know, use that, those tokens as features. But instead, what I want to do is um, show how to use some, like a separate analysis, identify words that I'm most interested in, and then use that to create, um, so to create a small number of features, just like one or two. So this, this is, um, something I don't think I've shown, like that, that how to do, and that often, um, you know, it's a, it's an approach that we often might be interested in doing. So let's, to, sh to find these words that we are interested in, let's um, take that raw data. Let us, um, let's do the same thing we did here to get um, a numeric sort of center of those bins. Let's um, tr uh, tra let's t um, tokenize and tra transform these description words into um, uh, a tokenized tidy format, and let's remove the stop words like so. So let's call this Austin tidy, and then let's show what are the most common words. like so. Okay, so home, kitchen, room, Austin, new, large, two bedrooms, and the three bedrooms contains. So those are the most common words. If we um, you treated the, um, the text as features, um, these would be the, to so, you know, some of the tokens that would be most common. But instead, let's find what words are changing with, um, with price. So let's take, let's find, um, let's find like the top hundred words. So we're going to do that same thing we just did. Sort equals true. Um, I don't want, I don't want um, those one, two, three, four kind of words because that actually is already in the data set as number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms. So let's get, let's take those out. I'm not so interested in those. 
And let's take, a, so that, that will then have an N. And let's take the top 100 words. Word. So let's call this um, top words. So with, you know, various kinds of filtering, these are the top words used in the, um, in the uh, real estate descriptions in these Austin listings. So bathrooms, park, access, entertaining, counters, countertops, neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera. Now let's, um, uh, so let's count word price range. So we're saying how often is each word used in um, each price range bin. Let's complete that in case there are some that are missing. Whoops, price range like that. So we'll say fill equals list n equals zero. So we're gonna count up. So we say um, how many for each price range um, how many times is each token used? Let us then find a, um, so let's group by the price range and let's find a price total, like how many words are, um, used total for each price range and a proportion, which is the N divided by the price total. And then let's filter so we only keep the words in the top words. Because those are the only ones I want to um, analyze further. Let's call these word frequencies. Okay. What does that look like? So, so this is access in these price ranges, bins. Um, how many times are they used? How many words total are used? to describe each one of these uh, price bins. And so what proportion of the total words used to describe houses in this price range are the word access? And then next for appliances. So what we can do with this is we can uh, train a set of um, linear models. So let's nest. We wanna nest everything except word like that. <clears throat> All right, that worked. Um, and then we are going to train a model. So what the model does, we're gonna use per map. So we're gonna map over that data and we're gonna use a generalized linear model. And so what's gonna go on the Y side is N, uh, oh, sorry, it's a comma. N out of price total. So this is, it's like, um, it's like binomial, right? Like if this, these are the successes and these are the um, failures, I guess, or oh, total possibilities. Um, how does that depend on price range? So does, does the, does the success, does the number of successes, like the proportion of successes, does it depend on price range? That's what we're modeling here. And then let's see if I can get the dots right. <laughs> We've got a lot of parentheses going here. So the dot here is for the data. And then I have to say family equals binomial. I'm pretty sure. All right. I think I've got something messed up. GLM. Family binomial. Yeah, I don't, something, <laughs> I have something messed up. Okay, model map. Pri oh yeah, I don't, this is wrong. Okay, there we go. Okay, so great. So I think this will train all the models, right? So fast, just a little bit linear models. And then I can say model map model tidy. So this will tidy all the models. So I have little, um, data frames instead of little GLM objects. And then I can unnest the models like so. And all I want uh, are those, uh, I don't really care about the intercepts. I just care about the slopes like that. And um, I, I uh, trained a whole bunch of models there, a hundred of them. So it's a good idea for me to adjust those p-values, p-values. At 100, 
maybe it doesn't make a huge difference, but, but you know, it's getting to be a lot. And if I, let's, let's arrange like this. Let's call this word mods for word models. So I've trained a, a hundred little models. And um, so the, these are the estimates that are um, the biggest, is that right? Yes. And so these words are the words that are most associated with high price, outdoor, custom, pool, office, sweet, gorgeous. Um, if I do it the other way, mods, carpet, paint, close, flooring, shopping. These are the words that are most associated with low price. This is pretty interesting, actually. So a cheaper house, you know, and the listing is going to say, hey, it's got new carpet and paint. It's close to shopping. Whereas expensive houses, you don't say those things about them. The expensive houses, you, you talk about the pool and how gorgeous the pool is and the custom outdoor, I don't know, kitchen or whatever. I'm not sure. Um, okay. So let's make a visualization of this and we're going to make something that is actually similar to a, um, to a volcano plot. If you are familiar with that. So we're going to put that estimate, the, which is the effect size on the X axis and the P value on the Y axis. Whoops. And let's, um, let's put a line at zero, a dash line. And then let us um, put these points on it. Um, I'll make them a nice color that I like. Uh, okay. I don't know, something like this. Okay. So, ah, so plots like this usually have the Y axis on the log scale for just exactly the reason of what we're looking at here. And so this shape here, um, is, is, you know, if you've looked at volcano plots, this is what we, this is the shape that we get, right? Um, so we've got um, these positive values, which are with high price, the negative values, which are with lower price. Let us pop on the, um, the words. So text I'm going to use from GG repel. I am going to use the function geom text repel. I'm going to say label equals word equals word. And I'm going to make the, um, uh, the fonts match when I was already using. So there's a lot, they're overlapping. They can't, they can't, there's too many of them, especially cause I'm zoomed in here pretty big. Um, so a uh, great. So over here we see these ex words associated with high price, these words associated with low price over here. Um, it's just very interesting to me um, how we can see these differences. And so these are what we're going to try to use in our um, in our machine learning model of predicting price. We've used this other supporting analysis um, to identify them. And then we're going to we're going to, you know, incorporate this into our machine learning model. So let's make a data set of higher words. So we have this word mods. Um, let's let's take um, you know, take a, a, a threshold on our p-value and let's take a, um, let's take, let's take a, uh, uh, ooh, sorry, um, the top 12 words here and let's pull out word, if I can type that. And let's do the same thing for lower words. So these are words that are associated with high price, words that are associated with low price. And so we need to change this to a minus like that. So high price is, so higher words. These are these words, right, that we've been looking at, lower words. There we go. 
Um, ah, so these are probably, um, uh, uh, you know, townhomes, condos, if they're maybe, I, I'm guessing, tile. <laughs> you only care about new tile in an inexpensive house, which is very interesting. Um, and we can, we, can, we can look directly at these changes if we want. So for example, let's look at the high words. <clears throat> Whoops. Filter a word and higher words. And then we can put, um, I forget what's in here. Okay, so we can put um, price range on the x-axis, that proportion on the y-axis. Let's color by word. Oops. And let us, um, let's make this pretty thick because we don't have that many points here. Just, we only have as many points as we have price range bins. Whoops. Geom line. There we go. And let's facet wrap by word, like so. Okay, nice. So let's make scales equals free y so we can see these. And um, so that x continuous, let's make... Um, uh, let's use from the scales package. Use let's use dollar like that. I'll I'll zoom this in so it looks a little better. Scale. This is continuous as well, um, and this is a percent, like so. And we can. Um, I, sometimes it's nice to see where zero is on all of those, and so we can make them all have zero like that. Okay. So let's take a look here. So this is pretty interesting. So expensive houses are more likely to talk about how many car garages they have, three car, maybe four car or more, custom, gorgeous, pool, um, outdoor increases a lot. So see how these all increase. Now let's look at the lower words. And these, you know, just the, the opposite story, right? Um, carpet, easy, minutes, like location. It's pretty interesting to me that the inexpensive houses are asserting how important location is, but it's so clear how important location is in price based on the maps that we looked at. So it's like these inexpensive houses, homes are asserting in their <laughs> descriptions how important their location is, how great um, their location is and how, how easy and close and how, how few minutes and it is to where they're needing to go, but obviously they are in a location that is less expensive. Pretty interesting if you ask me. Okay, so we did it. So these things, higher words, lower words, that's what we're going to use in the model. So now let's do that. Let's get started on our modeling. This is going to be a little bit of a longer um, screencast because I did a little bit of some uh, and not pr like ahead of time analysis to um, do some feature engineering. So let's load tidy models. So I'm going to take um, that uh, training data. I'm going to, I'm not going to use that city because it was, uh, you know, I can show you again right here, but count. Oh, um, I saw this as well when I did, um, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to bother with that. That's not so useful. And while I'm here, I am going to um, change the um, description all to lower. I guess I could do that in the recipe in my feature engineering as well, but I'll just do that right here for convenience. And I am going to do such stratified resampling. Let's call this Austin split. So I'm first splitting between testing and training, and I can use this split to create a tra training um, set. So this is a training set. I can um, use it to create a testing set. 
And let's also create some resampling folds, some resampled folds. I'm going to create cross validation folds because there's quite a lot of data here, as you have probably noticed. I'm going to create the resampling folds from the training data. I'm not going to create 10 because this is this is a big data set, um, and I'm. Eh, and it's already going to take a while to train, as I could have experience from the sliced, um, you know, the sliced episode this past week. Um, I'm, I'm just going to do 10, I mean 5, not the full 10. Let's call this Austin Folds, like so. All right, so training testing resample full. So this, think about this as spending your data budget. You have a certain amount of data um, and you have to decide how are you going to budget it. You, so you allocate a certain amount for training, a certain amount for testing, and then you can use that training data to create simulated training and testing sets, uh, which we call analysis and assessment sets, to be able to uh, choose between models, tune models, and whatnot. All right, now it's time for the feature engineering part of this model. So I am gonna use the glue, glue, collapse function on that higher words vector that I have. And I'm gonna use um, that, because when I do that, it collapses it into something I can use as a regex pattern. So let's call that the higher price pattern. And let's call this the lower pattern. We're going to do this with lower words, words like so. So this, I'm going to, this, I'm going to use this in the recipe. And let's start the recipe. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to predict price range, basically with everything, just the whole shebang, just, just throw it all in, and uh, stir it up. <laughs> See what we get. Okay, so what what is in this training data? I'm gonna um, update the role of the UID and this I because I it's not a predictor, right? So I'm just gonna call it UID. So you can call this anything. If it's not predictor or outcome, it will be not be used in the model in a workflow. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this right he, this right here. I'm gonna use a a um, feature engineering step called step regex or I, that's how I say it regex I'm not sure some people might pronounce that differently so what we're going to do here is we create a new dummy or indicator variable based on regular expression so if you look down here at the um, examples uh, this is about like rock cover uh, or ground cover and what it's doing is it's saying um, hey if you see the pattern rock or stony um, call make a new thing called rocks and if and make it like yes no yes no rest yes no um, and so that is how that is how this works so we're gonna do it twice step step regex we're gonna do it on description um, pattern equals higher pat like so and let's call this high price words and then let's just do the whole thing again for the low price words low price words like so and then i i don't want description anymore I'm just going to remove it because I'm not going to like tokenize and wait by TFIDF and all that kind of business. I'm only using, I'm not teaching, treating each of the tokens like a feature. I'm just identifying, does it have the high price words? Does it have the lowest price words? And if not, um, I'm just going to remove it. Um, I do have, if we look at... Um, if we look at the training data right here, we've got a... We've got a um, uh, categorical variable here. We've got a lot of, I think this will just get turned into zeros and ones, and the rest of these are numeric, but um, let's, uh, let's do step novel on home type, step unknown on home type, because actually, um, I think I sh forgot to show doing this, but there is a little bit of some missing data in home type. 
See, just a little bit of some missing data. And so step unknown, step other on home type. I'm gonna up up, I'm gonna up the threshold and then I will um, step dummy. Uh, you know, I'm going to do step all nominal predictors just to catch um, has spa. I don't think it's going to, though. I think it's just going to change those to zeros and ones. And then let's do step um, n, z, v, all predictors. Predictors like that. Ooh, I'm going to do one hot equals true like that because that that can sometimes help in tree based models austin recipe is what we'll call this all right let's run it like there there we go okay and let's so we've got our feature engineering which is all set here now let's combine this um, with a model so once again uh, I was I use XGBoost XGBoost tends to perform well in a situation like sliced um, I think so what I'm about to show here I think is what I show was doing at the end um, so I'm gonna do a pretty big tuned model so I'm going to say um, tune the tree depth, tune um, min n, tune m try, tune um, sample size, tune the learning rate. So tune a lot. I'll tune a lot of the things. Um, uh, in some of the other, some of my other recent. Um, uh, screencasts and blog posts I show uh, some ways to make to tune faster if you want to get to a res good result a pretty good result quickly but this is like a let's try to do pr like well um, uh, very thoroughly so we're gonna because we're gonna tune a whole bunch of stuff and now let me put these things together let's call it X X G B word workflow and let's take a workflow workflow and let's add the recipe and the specification like so and uh, we got those all these things together so this workflow now um, is is ready to be tuned we do have to decide uh, we have a couple options when it comes to what are we going to tune here I am going to this time I'm going to show how to create a custom grid because I do I do actually want to do that um, I could just say like 20 and then it will automatically try to find 20 param possible parameter combinations for me to try. But here I am going to um, uh, specify something. So instead of going from 1 to 15, which is the default, I say, hey, don't go all the way down to 1. I don't want to try like stubs because I, I mean, I at least know from what happened already on um, a slice that like uh, stubs are not going to do me any good, like little tree stubs. So let's do, let's do these um, bigger, more complex. Um, uh, and I don't want to go all the way down to, um, I don't want to go all the way down to one. Let's do 5L and then I think like 10 would be good. I can, I can uh, double check prep. And let's look at what we have here. So what mtry is saying is like how many of the, um, yeah, yeah, I think 10 is good. Um, how many of the columns do we want to try? And then let's do a sample. I think I do sample, if I do sample prop like this, I don't need to go down to point one. Let's do only go down to um, uh, point five. I am just like not exploring the space as much because I don't I I guess I guess it's cheating a little bit because I know a little bit from what um what happened on slice what will work well but to be honest that is what happens a lot anyway so this is a grid see here I'm saying try 20 things xgb grid like so uh so if I let me save this as a grid so we've got, um, see it, and by grid max entropy, what I'm saying is, I'm saying try to cover this space in an efficient way without doing a regular grid. So it often works well for this kind of result. All 
All right, so now let's get started on this. I am going to use um, Fine Tune um, again, uh, which has uh, racing methods. The reason I'm going to do this is because some of these combinations are going to not turn out well, and I want to throw them away quickly. I don't want to keep going with them for forever. So I'm going to save these in a result. So I'm going to use Tune Ray. Let me load this. Whoops. Let's use Tune race ANOVA like this. So I'm going to put in my workflow. I'm going to put in my um, resampling folds. I'm going to put in my um, grid. I am going to put in some metrics for it to decide um, uh, how, like whether it's good or bad, this particular a challenge used uh, multi-class log loss. And then let me put in uh, a little bit of some logging so it can tell me when, what, what it uh, eliminated here. And let's get started on this. So this is going to take a little bit, even with my, my parallel processing running. So what it's doing is for each of these, I have five, um, resamples, and it's trying 20 of these possible parameters. So we're training 100 XGBoost models right here. It's not going to train all 100 because it's going to stop and throw away some when they turn out badly, but it's going to keep going. So let's pause this, and then I'll come back when um, it's done. All right. All right, it is finished. Um, and so this, this, uh, a uh, logging that we see here is what we get. Um, what we get because of um, this this uh, argument right here. So it tells us, you know, by the time it got to this fold, it had eliminated half of them here. By this fold, it eliminated some some more. So we can view that that race, as it were, by looking at. Um, this plot here, um, as you can see, you know, like these are the ones that are the, the sets of parameters that are obviously bad. And so the Tune Race Nova, what it says is like, don't keep going with those. They're no good. Let's, let's not keep evaluating them. Let's only keep going with the ones that look good. And so that those are these, these ones that are down here. And so um, we can you know, keep going with these results and do things like we can use functions like show best, which will let us see these. And we, um, so we get, you know, this is what it is, the resampled results on the, um, on the training set here. And we can see, you know, here's what we get in the, here are the parameters that we have here. And um, then the next thing we can do, you know, select best and whatnot. So that's, that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to take that word workflow, which was tunable. I'm going to finalize it with the best option from the, um, that result. I'm going to choose the best option by log loss. And then I'm going to use the last fit to fit one time to the training data and evaluate one time on the um, testing data, like so. So this gives us a last fit object. Um, so it is, um, it's updating the tuned workflow and then fitting one time, one last time, on the training data, and then it will evaluate one time on the testing data. So we're, we've we fit nearly 100, or I guess less than that, but a many, many XGBoost models, and we're fitting one last time. All right, so here is that result here. Um, so this object contains a couple of interesting things. Um, predictions, it contains predictions. So the predictions here are not on the um, testing, on, not on the training set, they are on the testing set. So if I run this, what this gives us is predictions on the um, on the test set here. And so we've got, but we have a predicted probability of landing in each, each one of these price spins. So I can, for example, pr um, compute the log loss. Um, we've got the, uh, the real price range. 
And then I have that, um, that predicted probability of being in each one of these uh, price ranges here. So let's copy this like that. All right, and so this is the um, multi-class log loss that I get on the testing set. So this is, you know, like mo what's most equivalent to what's on the leaderboard on um, Kaggle, and this is a little bit better than what I got um, during sliced. So it would, you know, would be nice to get even a little better than that. But for one model, this is this is. Um, not not bad pretty good pretty good so let's see um let's let's explore a little bit more so we can see um what wh like what is driving our results here so we can do a um, confusion matrix by looking not at the uh not at the uh, looking at the the predicted class the hard class predictions so you know it looks like this we can also do a an auto plot here like this. And this is where we start to understand some interesting things about these classes. Notice in the high class, the high price bin, um, how right the model is. The model had a pretty easy time of predicting the highest um, priced houses, probably because of um, where they are, um, but maybe because of other things like, um, you know, schools or whatever. But then as we move this way, it becomes harder and we're starting to do a worse and worse job of predicting, um, of predicting the, the price bin. So it's harder to get these, you know, these, these other bins predicted correctly. We'll be able to see the same thing if we do a, um, and I copy this if we do an ROC curve. So let's do ROC curve like this. We could do um, an auto plot, but that puts them on separate. Yeah. Well, instead of that, let's uh, let's do one minus specificity. Speci. This T. Oh my gosh, what am I doing wrong? Why doesn't it like this? Surely I don't have to type the whole thing out. There we go. We'll say color equals, what's it called? Dot level. And let's say geom path. And let's do like a chord equal on there. Like so, yes. And labs color equals uh, equals null, like that. Okay, so let's, let's, wow, that's, that's pretty interesting. So the fact that the, um, the highest price bin is so much farther in the corner. Um, it, you know, it shows us again how much easier it is to identify those expensive houses than these less expensive houses. So that is, um, that is pretty interesting here. Um, so let's, let's do one more thing. Let's look at the variable importance. So I am going to extract the workflow from that last fit object like this. So that's a trained workflow. Then I'm going to extract the parsnip object from it. And then I am going to compute the um, variable importance using the VIP package. So this is, um, this is model-based variable importance based on all the trees that are in this model. So it's going through computing all the variable importance based on those 1,000 trees. And um, OK, this is, this is super duper interesting. So spatial information, lot size, schools, year built. And we, we move down here. And um, 
notice that high price words is not in here. Um, so, the, so the model is not trying to use the high price words. I bet you that those high, those high priced homes are just, um, are just pretty easy to find and that the model does not need, you know, that information to try to find it. The model did try to use the low price words uh, to try to do a better job of finding the, um, the lower uh, price homes. And, you know, like it's probably why I'm doing a little better here than in those models I did during Sliced um, where I did not get this working um, and, and, you know, had my, my, my troubles and all that kind of thing. Notice that low price words is about the same as, um, you know, like whether it's a single family home versus a condo or a townhome, a little more important and like more important whether it has a spa or not. So it's kind of like on that, on that order and less important than these guys up here. Um, so <clears throat> I think, I think that's, I, I actually think this is really interesting. This shows how, um, mod models like these can, you know, have the, have the freedom to choose which models to give different amounts of weight to and, um, uh, and sort of give these different relative importance, um, in this way. All right, I think that was pretty interesting how um, the model used the lower price words but not the higher price words to identify like that, those more difficult to find um, uh, categories in this multi-class classification challenge. Um, so this model did perform better than the, um, than the ones that I, that I trained during the episode of Slice that did not have this this um, text information incorporated, which is also pretty interesting, just by a little bit, but you know, a little bit better. And um, if you wanted to do even better, if you wanted to make a model that performed a little better, some other things I might try might be to um, uh, balance the data set, maybe use upsampling to um, uh, balance them so that the model can do a better job of recognizing all of the different um, the different price categories and of course um, to ensemble uh, the model to um, instead of just using one model uh, to use um, several and to to weight them um, so i hope this was helpful and i'll see you next time